Hello and welcome to another episode of the podcast in which the analysis collides with the barricade. This episode is a collaboration between the editorial teams of the two outlets. My name is Bojan Stanislavski and I'm a senior editor at the barricade. I'll be filling in for Paul J, who is unable to host today's show due to a last minute scheduling conflict. Malgorzata Kulbachevska of the Polish leftist portal Strike, Maria Czernat and Vladimir Mitev, with whom I have the pleasure of working at the Barricade, are with me today. Welcome to all of you. Hello. All right, so the main topic of today's discussion is authoritarianism, specifically uh, new authoritarian tendencies in Europe, the EU, and most notably Eastern Europe. And this is why all four of us here were invited to speak on the subject, because this is the region from which we all hail and with which we are most familiar. Some European leaders have made it clear in recent years that uh, they are concerned about democratic backsliding and, and creeping authoritarianism in some member states. As a result, the EU created even a new mechanism in late 2020 that links allotment uh, of, of union funds to EU member states' uh, respect for uh, the rule of law, whatever that means. The EU's uh, funding values uh, and, and, and even foreign policy objectives to some extent are both uh, uh, threatened uh, to, I, I think, by the slow autocratization of political uh, regimes around the world uh, and, and in Europe, of course, uh, which is now widely recognized for years, the EU has struggled to respond to this autocratization within Europe, especially in Hungary and Poland. Uh, the problem was exacerbated by sending EU funds to governments that undermined democracy and human rights and, and rule of law. Uh, the new rule of law conditionality is an attempt to strengthen, uh, I suppose, the EU's kind of toolkit to respond to, to uh, those these trends. Uh, but for the time being, it doesn't appear to be really going anywhere. The EU is uh, still a dog that barks a lot but doesn't really bite and and you know the question here is uh that i'd like to start with is the eu however our only hope because this is how it's widely presented uh, that is uh, the only hope of those who believe authoritarian reactionary tendencies are politically dangerous especially in the light of eu's own authoritarianism uh, which seems to be the unspoken elephant in the room instead we get a lot of you know anti-russian and anti-chinese rhetoric so i want to i want to go first to uh Malgojata with this question is the EU our only hope, because we can all recognize, especially yourself and myself, since we've lived in Poland, or I've lived in Poland for the last 20 something years, and you are from Poland, you've always lived here. So, you, you know, we kind of understand very well the, the, the dangers and, and, and the problems with authoritarian governments like the one of uh Formally speaking, Mateusz Morawiecki, but uh, practically Jarosław Kaczynski's government here in Poland that uh, <clears throat> that is backed by an, a Catholic fundamentalist right-wing party called Law and Justice, and 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 that's been in power for the last uh, six years. So. Yeah, it's it's a problem. Obviously, there are many problems linked to that uh, political process, but is is the EU our only hope? What do you think? Well, uh, I think that not only the EU is not our only hope to get rid of authoritarian government in Poland, but I would, I would even say more. We were already members of the European Union for more than a decade when Jarosław Kaczyński's party won, won parliamentary elections and began dismantling the rule of law. And uh, we were already, we were even praised as a country that did great progress in terms of democracy, in terms of functioning within the European community. And 
Poland even had the ambitions to lead other Eastern European countries such as Belarus or Moldova into the European community. And after that, Polish, uh, the Polish voters voted for conservative nationalist party, law and justice, as you said, and uh, all the progress that we made like disappeared. So it turns out that uh, not only European Union is not a remedy against authoritarianism, but even where, but it's exactly the opposite way. The rise of authoritarian tendencies and uh, non-democratic parties within in Poland and in any other uh, state that that belongs to European Union is a result of an internal dynamic of the of this of the ones of the society and of every particular state and the european union has rather proved that it can't really do anything if something like this happens well uh, i would uh, also point out to one thing Jarosław Kaczyński and his party are being criticized by the european union from the very beginning of their government and still the European Union did nothing that could really undermine their position. Their position. And uh, what is even worse, in my opinion, the European Union intervened this in the strongest way, not at the moment when it should have reacted. Let me just remind you that uh, law and justice government came under heavy criticism after um, after uh, the uh, pop, after Polish conservatives began their anti-LGBT campaign, which is of course odious and uh, is worth of this criticism, but Euro European Union's answer to anti-abortion law that was uh, introduced in Poland in lately uh, last year was not that strong even. So it seems that not only European Union is ineffective when defending democracy but also does not respond uh, to the to this uh, to the will of these citizens of Poland that want to defend democracy act so that is my impression and second and finally i'm happy that you mentioned that the european union has its own authoritarian tendencies and i f and let me just add one more thing european union did not appear on political scene as a club of honest democrats or people who wanted to bring social justice and happiness to everybody it is an economic project it is a capitalist project and so we need to look at european union and its capacities within the logic of profit which is internal to capitalism and in this context we will understand much better why some why the authoritarian tendencies in the some of the western countries are left behind while you, the european union looks with such an interest on hungary and poland Okay, thanks for that. And I'd like to go to Maria now with the question of, because obviously there are, again, let's just state the obvious, okay, for the sake of the, uh, of the argument that uh, there are authoritarian tendencies and they are dangerous. And we can see that in, in many cases like, you know, mine and Malgojadze, we can feel that, we can experience that. Uh, and, uh, and we're obviously against it. But uh, strangely enough, uh, you know, when it comes to, uh, to, to, uh, to discuss authoritarianism in in the media, uh, okay? Then normally, you know, our journalists they point uh, uh, they point to uh, to Russia, to uh, to China, you know, and they say that the danger comes from there, somewhere from the east, and that this is uh, uh, this is a process that we have to counter, that we have to contain, that we have to you know prevent from uh, sort of uh, 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 you know. Mm, getting root in the European Union, in, in, in Europe in general. But uh, is, this, is, is this authoritarianism, in your opinion, uh, some kind of attempt to copy the Chinese uh, 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 political uh, system or the Russian political system uh, in, in, Rome, uh, in, you know, in Poland, Hungary, whatever, Bulgaria? Uh, or is it rather uh, a process uh, that uh, has its own dynamic and the roots of which we can rather look for, uh, particularly in the processes that happen in the West, not so much in the East, because that's where we are integrated. And we can obviously see growing authoritarian tendencies, not only in Poland and Hungary, but also in Great Britain, in France, in Denmark, you know, in, 
in many countries we can see uh, oh in italy right we're, uh, we're, we can see the the rise of what is largely referred to as the populist right okay and obviously th there there is an authoritarian element in this uh in in those movements and, and i'm wondering uh whether uh it, uh it it's it, it's just hypocrisy or maybe uh there is even an attempt to defend some authoritarianisms at the expense of other authoritarianisms and to create this artificial uh, uh, division that there are good authoritarianisms like the EU's authoritarianism and bad authoritarianisms like uh, Russian, Chinese, or I don't know, uh, Cuban for that matter. What's your take? Please go ahead. Well, in terms of authoritarianism, we have to define this term. What does it mean, actually? What does it mean to have authoritarianism? Because it's very uh, hard to define. What do you mean by that? And uh, my perspective is the following. You have authoritarianism in economy or you have authoritarianism in politics. And unfortunately, the European Union wants to make some sort of peace and wants to, uh, you know, um, make compatible the economic authoritarianism with the political democracy. And for decades, we've been fed this uh, narrative that it is indeed the only way, because there is no way, uh, there is no alternative, if we remember the famous quote from uh, um, uh, Margaret Thatcher. So, um, for decades, we've been fed this narrative that basically, Capitalism is the only way to guarantee democracy. While what we are seeing in the past three decades, especially in Romania, is that it is almost impossible to make co uh, compatible the economic authoritarianism, the economic inequality, the ensuing poverty, and all the social evils that result from this type of organizing the economic system and democracy. And I will turn now to a famous British philosopher that is a liberal. I will not turn to Marx. I will turn to Isaiah Berlin, who wrote four essays on liberty, and he is praised, you know, and cherished among the most important liberal philosophers. And in his essays, he wrote the following, offering political and civil liberties to people who are hungry is mocking them, is to mock them. So this is not, this is not coming from Marx. This is coming from the core of the liberal political philosophy. So how come we ended up, especially in Romania, believing that this way of organizing economy, where you have a small elite of people that are well off and the vast majority of people that are extremely poor, can be made compatible with democracy? Of course, it cannot. It is a structural problem, if you'd ask me. And the last thing that I want to emphasize, since you put a general question to Malgorzata, and I would like, the, this is my final thought, I would like to comment on that. Of course, the European Union was built as an economic project. And the idea was that the economist and the economic system has to somehow discipline the political uh, you know, system, and uh, that you will have stability and prosperity once you put the economy first. They never thought that the economy itself is done by people, not by robots, and you will have the corruption, you will just move the problem somewhere else. And this is just, you know, at the surface of things. When you come back to me for my next take, I will discuss also some numbers, some staggering numbers here in Romania that would, that would support what I just said. Right, right. Thanks. Uh, so before I go to Vladimir, I just want to uh, refer to uh, the question of European Union being uh, an economic project or an economic community. Uh, and of course, it is that. But I think that if uh, in the context of growing authoritarianism, one has to, uh, one cannot really ignore the fact that the European Union at the end of the 90s and at the beginning uh, of the 21st century, uh, some 
something happened, okay? I, I mean, th- something changed in a major manner because from being an economic community, I think they they decided they're going to try and make uh, they're going to make an attempt to create something more than just economic community. They're going to try and integrate, uh, you know, Eastern Europe and and uh, other you know countries. And they're going to try and do uh, and create some kind of super national organization, which is not exactly a state, but you know it issues its own passports. Okay, it has its own borders, like two kinds of borders: the Schengen border and the outside, you know, uh, border of the European Union. And uh, uh, and and you know, it has its own legal system, which is superior to the legal systems of the countries that belong to that community. And you know, it produces. Uh, certain processes which I have the feeling they got pretty much out of control or perhaps they they are uh, you know the they, they are are the result of, of the law of unintended consequences uh, anyway uh, I, I want to, uh, we could discuss that a little later I suppose but I want to go to Vladimir now and I want to ask you know Vladimir, I come from Bulgaria. I've lived there uh, for quite some time as a kid and teenager uh, before I emigrated to Poland. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, my observations when it comes to Bulgaria uh, are, are a little more superficial or more general maybe than yours because you are there on the ground. But we could agree, but I think we can agree that the Bulgarian regime of the last, uh, well, almost 15, how, how many years was it? 12 or 13 years of Boyko Borisov's reign and his party, GERP, which is, uh, you know, by and large, the in, the, an invention of, of, of the German uh, conservatives, that it was, or it, you know, or it has been, because the mechanisms are still in place, uh, a kind of authoritarian regime. Not a very, maybe not the most classical version of authoritarian regime, maybe not in such an overt manner, uh, like the way we can observe that in Poland or in Hungary, uh, like, you know, the countries which confront the European Union and its, you know, liberal ideology and so on and so forth with its uh, overt authoritarianism. Okay, they even, you know, boast about it, like when you look at Kaczynski and Orban and their, uh, you know, acolytes. Uh, but in Bulgaria, we've also had that. And somehow, somehow, no one has really paid much of an attention to this. I mean, no one spoke about, you know, how they're going to uh, prevent the flux uh, of money, the flow of money from the European Union to Bulgaria uh, because of, you know, the rule of law not being uh, uh, <clears throat> implemented properly and obviously there are problems no matter how you actually understand this notion of rule of law there is nothing even remotely resembling the rule of law in bulgaria so why do you think that is like how come some authoritarianisms are are ignored and some authoritarianisms are are uh you know uh, uh, being uh, criticized actively, despite the fact that particularly, you know, the Belarusian, for example, uh, authoritarianism or the Russian authoritarianism, they are outside the European Union, yet, you know, they are our main concern, you know, somehow. What's your take? First, uh, before answering to your question, I'd like to add something on the EU. You said that in the 90s it changed, and I guess uh, you mean uh, the change which was... Um, provided for by the Jacques Delors uh, uh, white papers, which defined the EU as union of competition. And uh, we have to remember that the EU started more as a solidarity union. It, it was a large uh, project of the left uh, after the World War II. And this evolution to European Union of competition, it, I guess it, uh, it, uh, it, is, it changed the course for a number of decades, and it is uh, what we see now. And in the case of uh, Bulgaria, uh, we know that uh, Boyko Borisov uh, was on good terms with uh, Viktor Orban, and uh, Bulgaria had this image, and I guess still has uh, the image of the most, uh, po- the poorest and the most corrupt country in the EU. Uh, but uh, as we see this uh, cooperation and verification mechanism, which exists for Bulgaria and Romania, and which observes their judicial system. And in the case of Bulgaria, also uh, the links to the mafia, to local mafia, it uh, hasn't uh, provided any significant change in Bulgaria uh, in terms of uh, fight against corruption. 
and uh, uh, it looks like Burisov was just a clever Orban for a long time in the sense that uh, he didn't oppose openly the West. He was uh, somehow collaborating with uh, foreign investors while also providing better conditions for Bulgarian capital, for Bulgarian firms who supported his political project. And we see that uh, the EU, uh, maybe if that, that could be a fault, uh, the international bourgeoisie, if we may say, collaborates very well with the local one, the national one, even though they somehow sometimes are presented as competitors um, and uh, having opposite interests. And why Borisov was not um, uh, observed, I guess um, for a number of years, uh, just I'd, both outside and inside, there was some kind of agreement that he is, let's say, the European face of Bulgaria. And importantly, he had the backing of um, the, the American side. And I guess uh, the changes which we started seeing in the last year with the protests, which started exactly one year ago, and they they were opposed to the anti-corruption uh, agenda of um, uh, which was applied by the chief prosecutor. But uh, that is a, a long issue, and maybe I could return to that later. In any case, um, these protests showed that the consensus about Borisov is changed, and as we see now, it looked like Borisov government which was union with the nationalists it was a coalition with the nationalist party vmro it was well set for the trump times and we know what trump means and represents i guess uh so uh but when biden came to the white house uh it is obvious now that uh, borisov is no longer uh the desired face of bulgaria be it western european whatever you call it and uh, I guess what we see now in Bulgaria is uh, a gradual dismantlement of um, his regime. And uh, I guess it will take time because uh, it was um, his party was equal in a way to the party state, which we used to have until the 1989. And uh, it will take time. Which was authoritarian, guess, obviously, as well. Yes, and it, it, I guess that is the reason why Bulgarians now can't form a government, one of the reasons. Uh, of course, um, another reason, if I may say just in short, is that we don't have the political culture of dialogue. And I guess that is another aspect to the authoritarian discussion. That's a very good we point. Have. Uh, we have a number of leadership parties, parties with the leader. And uh, uh, they are somehow very disciplined parties, but there is you know, often there is no internal political life in those parties. And they have their kind of authoritarian structures. So that's true. Uh, that, that explains one of the reasons, not the only one, why now the parties which come in parliament after Borisov is gone can't uh, reach an agreement and form a government. Yeah, thanks for that. I think it's a, it's a very insightful remark because uh, that, that kind of speaks to the question whether we actually do have real choice. Mm -hmm. You know... Uh, whether we actually do have a real choice between uh, uh, authoritarianism and democracy. Like, in theory, of course, we do have that choice, right? Like, we we have all kinds of choices. But uh, I'd like to go to Malgojata now, because, Malgojata, you're a historian, uh, so you, you know uh, a, a little more about the history of the political regimes uh, in, in Europe. And, you know, I find it a bit strange and quite infantile, really, uh, to speak about democracy as if it has always been around. You know, I, I mean, this is like, this is how authoritarian regimes are presented uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the public opinion, particularly in the West, as if democracy is, 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 is a construct that has always been around since the inception of humanity or, 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 or whatever, uh, right? Uh, or since the beginning of the recorded history of humanity. And now suddenly there is... The, the, there are those incidents which are inexplicable because, you know, Orban is terrible, Kaczynski is terrible, and, and Putin is terrible. And, you know, I, I agree to a certain extent that those are terrible politicians. I mean, obviously, I'm a left-wing, uh, 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 you know, I, I'm a leftist, so I, I don't like authoritarian tendencies. But I just can see that they are demonized beyond any reason. Like, you know, when you look at the history of, uh, particularly, the, of particularly Eastern Europe, and, and you know, you will easily observe and come to the conclusion that uh, for the last 
couple of hundred years, some kind of authoritarianism was and, and it has been the norm and not uh, uh, the exception, okay, as, if, uh, as it is presented right now, which means, and I don't want to come across as, as a defendant of, uh, you know, as someone who defends authoritarianism or authoritarian tendencies today, and I do not think that today's authoritarianism is, is, is a simple extension of whatever happened 100 years ago, 200 years ago, or even 50 or, or, or 60 years ago, right, Be, before and after the Second World War. But still, I mean, this should not be, I suppose, presented as something which is really our biggest problem because throughout the history, modern history, okay, our biggest problem here in Eastern Europe was not so much lack of democracy, but it was poverty. That was the most important thing, okay? I mean, if you look at 100 or 150 years ago, you will easily see that people used to function on the verge of biological survival, okay? And it's only gradually... Uh, you know, uh, started getting uh, kind of, well, civilized, okay? I, I mean, life became more and more bearable until the People's Republic, uh, People's Republics came, okay? Which was a major civilizational stride forward, despite the fact that those projects were authoritarian. I think we could, uh, easy, I, I think we can agree that, uh, you know, to a large extent uh, uh, throughout their uh, existence, they did enjoy uh, you know, a significant, uh, a significant amount of support from the side of the population, which was simply more interested, okay, the populations of those countries, of those people's republics were simply more interested in, in actual development, in, in, in actual civilizational uplift than in, in whether it's one party system or two party system and, and so on and so forth. Uh, do you think that this perspective, of course, I presented in very, very general terms, but do you do you think it's it's correct? Well, uh, on one hand, you may point out that indeed Eastern Europe uh, did not enjoy liberal democracy as it uh, for uh, for most of its history. On a, on the other hand, you may also point out that it was in Eastern Europe and specifically in Russia when the Russian Revolution took place and people actually tried to impose the most democratic system ever because the beginnings of the Russian Revolution was indeed a strife towards the council system or the Soviet system where ordinary people would decide everything on every level in a democratic manner, in a collective democratic manner. So as you can see, on the one hand, the indeed uh, Eastern Europe was is not a well, it's not the place where democracy seem obvious. And on the other hand, there uh, in every epoch of the history of Eastern Europe, you may point out to people who actually tried to organize in democratic manner outside of the system that they lived under, or they or who tried to democratize the system they lived under, but. Uh, mm, so, uh, in, in fact, uh, in terms of searching for popular democracy, Eastern European history is much richer than one might expect and definitely much richer than our Western, Euro that Western Europeans are gonna, going to admit that. But it, I think this is a subject for yet another debate. And here I would like to uh, stick to what you also said, that the poverty and I'd say civilizational backwardness was our key problem over centuries, over decades. And uh, still, we can see in Eastern Europe that uh, people... Um, and still, uh, we can't really understand the rise of new authoritarianism in Poland and in other countries of Eastern Europe if we don't take into consideration these economical and social contexts. Let us let me state the obvious again, if we already are doing this. People are not resorting to strong leaders in Eastern Europe only because they, they are disinterested in anything or that they want to be led by some, somebody wiser than them, but people are resorting to strong leaders who, in their opinion, are the ones who have a vision for the country and who have a vision to ensure a basic stability to everybody. And uh, this is the key reason for which uh, Kaczynski's party won its victory in 2015 and won another elections four years later, even after they actually began dismantling the rule of law. 
the, in Poland. The successes of, authorita of authoritarian or para-authoritarian parties in Eastern Europe in uh, modern years are actually quite easy to understand. We don't need to resort to, uh, to long history of the region. We should rather have a look at uh, what happened once the People's Republic fell and how the neoliberal transformation hit the populations. Let me just remind you that we are talking about uh, populations which were actually used to, uh, which got used to a state that actually cares of the citizens in some way. Of course, those were authoritarian states and of course, uh, the citizens did not enjoy a full set of democratic liberties and of course, these countries could have been reformed so that the liberties do, do emerge in them. But still, those were countries that offered a relative uh, and not that bad reason of uh, level of economic stability, which was definitely not obvious to those countries in the historic, in in the wider historical perspective. So I would say that resorting to strong leaders who offered a kind of stability was I want I would don't want to say a natural solution, but at least a solution that was worth considering for people in most of the countries of Eastern Europe. And uh, here we, we come again at the question of capitalism, neoliberalism and uh, throwing people into instability. We in the Eastern, uh, had the left in Eastern Europe been stronger after the beginning of the 90s. We could have gone another way. It was not, so we ended up with what we have. But the economic factor was first and we need to remember that. That's right. Uh, thanks a lot. And now I want to go to Maria with the question, because everything was, that was explained here uh, by all of you uh, so far it boils down to, uh, you know, those authoritarian regimes that have emerged recently in Eastern Europe or are emerging uh, and are attempting to take power in uh, Western Europe, they are a product, not so much of history, right, but rather a product of, of the current circumstances. And the current circumstances, when you look at them closely, you will see that they are very unfriendly uh, or hostile, you know, <laughs> to be straightforward, to, uh, to the working people, to the majority of those societies in the European Union or in Europe in general, like austerity, neoliberalism, and, you know, the general destruction of the uh, civilizational standards that were achieved in, you know, on the both sides of the Elbe River, basically, in the Eastern Bloc, former Eastern Bloc, and, and in Western Europe, okay? Uh, on, on the one side of the river, we had the Soviet model, and on the other side of the river, we had the Western social democratic welfare state model, right? And, and both of them actually failed in the final aftermath, and it's another conversation, of course, why and, and, and how the left has never analyzed that or never paid enough attention to that. But that's, uh, as I said, a different conversation. But look, uh, the other you know, the conclusion here is that those leaders, uh, you know, because of the circumstances, because of the difficulties, because of the hardships that we have to endure, uh, are the authoritarian strongman leaders and stuff like that are elected in a democratic manner. And, you know, my conclusion and my advice uh, to the Democrats, particularly to those Democrats, the professional Democrats, the professional citizens, the professional, you, you know, uh, liberals, okay, uh, is the following. Guys, yeah, guys, exactly. Guys, be a better candidate. Be a better candidate and win the elections. Offer to people something more. Because so far, you know, the, uh, everybody is free to, of course, spit venom at Kaczynski and Orban. And, and, and you can, you know, insult uh, 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 Lukashenko or, or, or uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, you know, endlessly, right? But, uh, well, this is not really how you win elections by insulting uh, people that you, uh, convictions of whom you don't like, right? I mean, not it doesn't seem like it's a very good strategy. And, and, and so please go ahead. Like, uh, what's your take? Well, it was, especially in uh, Romania, it proved to be a good one because you, if you have nothing else to offer, the PR tells you to find a target, so that people's frustrations are directed to that target. It's a PR classical PR move. We are not children here. We know how these things work. So if you don't have anything to offer and you don't have anything stable to build your political legitimacy on, 
then you have to find a suitable scapegoat. You have to find a nightmare. And it is a wonderful documentary that was done by the British filmmaker Adam Curtis, one of my favorites, is The Power of Nightmares. Because in an era where everybody's disillusioned, where everybody believes this mantra that there is no alternative, and we see everything going to waste and such a destruction of the environment, of the society all around us, that politicians can no longer sell us a bright future. So they have to build their political legitimacy by defending us from a powerful enemy or a powerful, you know, phantom that might come and get us. And that could be the Russians, the Russian rapists, the LGBT community, the Roma population, the women's organizations, whatever. If you don't have exactly the migrants, if you don't have something real, stable and convincing to offer, you have to make sure that the frustration of the population is targeted to some scapegoat that you find. And don't underestimate the power of the political propaganda. I'm going to share with you something very funny. Because something very funny, and at the same time, it could have been tragic, but something very funny happened today. A U.S. Hawk um, helicopter Uh, was forced to land, where else? In the middle of Bucharest, in one of the most, you know, crowded places of Bucharest. They were preparing to organize this orgy of, you know, fossil fuel, useless burning, uh, when uh, organizing the aviation day, when they want to show off, they want to do all sorts of tricks, you know, and show people, even my daughter, I, I must admit, because they, in order to reach the place where they were organized this uh, crazy event, they uh, reached uh, to my village. And I even have a picture, you know, with some Roma people, collecting, you know, waste and those people and the planes on the sky going for this aviation event. Now, this was a complete mess up, you know, (laughs) to be kind. I mean, to land a, a Hawk helicopter in the middle of Bucharest, I mean, we were lucky that a tragedy did not occur because just some trees, just some, you know, pillars, electricity pillars, and just some cars were destroyed. But just imagine right now on this um, so-called leftist uh, portal, media portal, the freedom, Libertate in Romanian, uh, just an article was written on how great the American soldier was that he was able to land that helicopter safely. I mean, can you believe that? And there are people cheering up, of course, and there is a huge hype, not on the fact that they are organizing a pointless event in the middle of Bucharest, you know, uh, or just outside, very close to Bucharest, and they are burning like crazy fossil fuel just to show off, you know, some killing machines so then young boys can be thrilled of the idea that they can get on board of that machine and just press a button and kill hundreds of people, you know? And... Nothing about that, but instead, the Romanian press, like a disciplined and obedient soldier, is writing about how clever, how, you know, skillful this pilot, this American pilot was, that he managed just to take down some trees and some, you know, electricity pillars. Now, this is the situation, and I promise you that I will come back with the, the, some figures. And the most staggering one is that Romania ranks number one in terms of um, poverty among children and the percentage of children in risk of poverty and social exclusion. Do you know how much, how high this percentage is? It's even higher than in Bulgaria. It's 38%. And another Almost st- half of them, really. 
almost half of them, and because we had that conversation uh, of the relation between poverty and contraception and all of that, 30% of the Romanians never buy contraceptions, means 30%, just imagine. So this is the civilizational downgrade, as you put it. This is the situation that we have. And on top of everything else, I would like to point out that what scares me the most are not the overt authoritarian leaders, but the concealed authoritarianisms that we have to face. Because what we are facing right now is some sort of concealed authoritarianism in Romania. Just listen to this. A union member organized a strike, and our colleague Radu Stoikica wrote about it. He was there while the workers were on strike, and today, the anti-corruption directorate went and placed him under judicial um, restrictions and started a criminal investigation. And against they the organizer the, of the strike. Exactly, against the union leader. And they have the nerve to put on their web uh, site the following. Uh, he said something, to reach a favorable solution to his interest, they claimed that he wanted to advance some sort of financial interest because the union had some stores, you know, uh, in the subways. So the whole idea is that he did not fight for the workers, but for that. And the workers were so stupid that ju they just follow along, follow the law. So they have the nerve to say that he is being investigated for, and I quote, organized and initiated the protest action of the 26th of March, 2021, which resulted in the blocking of underground trains for almost the entire days, which caused difficulties in, carried out, in carrying out the underground transport under the state emergency and coordinated the Metrorex employees, that is the name of the Romanian subway, uh, members, uh, some of whom held senior positions who were present at the illegal protests and kept in contact with them throughout the protest. They should have probably stayed isolated and not coordinate <laughs> throughout the protest. Co-opted traders, beneficiaries of the disputed premises under the coordination of other defendants, and caused the Metrorex employee present at the workplace to interrupt their working hours. Now, this is like... Um, there is a book, How PR Became the Cutting Edge of Corporate po uh, Power. And in as early as 1930, 1930 and something, there was this manual that was devised for those who wanted to break the strikes. And this is somehow, somehow copy-pasted from there, you know. I mean, the accusations, this whole thing of going after the leader and painting the leader as a corrupt person is something that scares me more than on an advert, you know, authoritarian leader. Because this is something more devious. And this is how the new authoritarianisms, you know, rule by using anti-corruption as a stick to destroy labor unions, to go after union leaders, to go after political opponents, you know. And of course, this is the situation I could go on and on, but I think right. not the picture. Yeah, but I think it's very important what you just pointed out, because there's a lot of talk about how there are authoritarian political leaders and how they, I don't know, crush protest movements or how they uh, enact some laws that we don't like because they go against whatever LGBT community is, uh, for example, freedoms and, and or I don't know, against women like in uh, Poland or both, actually. <laughs> That's what's happening in Poland right now. But but uh, and of course, uh, this is this is very bad. And th but this is very overt, right? Like you can just see it and you can spot it. You can point your finger at it and you can say that we don't like that and, and it shouldn't be happening because it's not more it's immoral it, it's politically dangerous it's it's uh you know it's harmful uh, uh to a, a large 
uh, portion of the population, okay, of, of the respective countries, like it could be Hungary, Poland, or whatever. Uh, thank you so much for the analysis, for the insightful remarks, and I want to thank our viewers, and I want to invite everybody to check out uh, theanalysis.news and to click on the donate button there, and to uh, check out the barricade online, and to go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash the barricade, and to check out the uh, video, uh, the YouTube channels of the respective platforms. Uh, thanks so much again, and stay healthy, and keep fighting, and we're going to see each other hopefully sometime soon. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.